Megan will leave you here for a heavy.com with Joseph the Beefcake Benavides. I'm cocky, but I'm pretty darn good. Cute new moves. That favorite interview. Oh man. Media influencer. The last time we had a sit-down interview like this, it was probably over three years ago. Honing into that level of detail. His aura, of course, is bread and butter with 15 of his. You got your secret juice trying to progress. It's not just the fighters who try to evolve, it's all of us. So yeah, looking forward to continuing the evolution. I'm now joined by UFC broadcaster, Megan O'Levy. Megan, thank you so much for joining us. Usually it's the other way around. You're interviewing me before a fight. Now I get to have a full circle moment, interview you and highlight the pioneer that you are. And a lot of people might not know, you're actually the first female to be on the UFC broadcast in the modern era. And you were kind of thrown in the deep end a little bit with the UFC wanting to kind of try something new with your role. How did that all come about? Uh, well, first off, Megan, I just have to say, you are amazing. I'm usually on the other side of the mic interviewing you, but now you can do both. So what can't she do? Um, but yes, I, that is absolutely correct. Um, I actually, um, when the UFC went over to ESPN, our very, very talented and ingenious production team um, headed by our fearless leader, Zach Candido, they had a lot of ideas and ESPN was open to trying those and essentially... Zach said, there are some things I want to do, um, starting with the show in Brooklyn, where I first added to the commentary team um, at the Octagon. And then the first pay-per-view that we did, which uh, was in Australia, is when we started the walkout hits that now seem to be such a part of the broadcast. But essentially, they were like, we want to try these, but you have one chance to prove the proof of concept is something we should continue with. So... We didn't really have a system for it, and it wasn't like we had like a ton of examples of it in other sports. It was something we kind of did ourselves, and I just felt like the weight of the world on my shoulders. Like, if I don't do this right, then the rest of the team can't do it. But essentially, because our production team is so incredible, our producers are so great, they you know, just helped me through the journey, and thankfully, um, I didn't crash and burn, so now it's just a regular part of our jobs. Definitely a lot of pressure on your shoulders pretty early on. And you're an incredibly crucial part of the broadcast, not just on fight night, but you have so many responsibilities during fight week. What does the preparation look like for you heading into a big event? You know, it's a good question because I think a lot of people often assume that as broadcasters, we're just kind of fed information on the spot and we repeat what we're told. But if you heard what was in our ears, it is not usually information. It's usually some sort of like, get to commercial break or this crazy thing is happening, get to that next. Um, so for me, you know, preparation is almost all encompassing every day um, of the week, whether we have an event or not. Just staying on top of the sport, staying on top of cards, I don't work. Um, but when it comes to an actual fight week, I mean, Tuesdays, really, it kicks off with the hardcore stuff. Wednesdays or Thursdays are our fighter meetings. It's all about scripts, asking the questions that other people haven't asked. I host a show on Friday mornings, then I do the pay-per-view weigh-ins and those interviews there. And then Saturday, you know, Saturday, the work, the, the prep work, which is so, so heavy on us, is done. But that's where, like, the memorization and the... Uh, being able to broadcast on the fly and just, you know, getting that call, hey, we need you to fill for a minute, what do you got? Um, so it's about kind of knowing everything you can about every fighter. And I have like a lot of notes that I refer to. And for those hits that you see, like, like you're just seeing on the screen where the fighters walk past me, that's something that has to be meticulously timed. So those are written, they're rewritten and rewritten again until I get it perfect. Um, that's all on me and you know and then you see the finished product on TV which hopefully I never mess up but you know we uh, we all have our issues but we get the read show we, we try to be perfect and a lot of people don't know that you do those hits from memory you don't have a prompter that you read off which I remember my uh, my jaw was on the floor when you told me that but <laughs> with the UFC's 30th anniversary coming up you've had a lot of events that you've worked a lot of memories moments you've done a lot of shows in Australia I know you love the coffee because I always see you posting <laughs> about it on your stories when you go there is there a favorite moment or memory story from working a card in Australia well, I'm going to give you two answers because I know that your producers are going to go, oh, okay, with the first answer. But it's truly my favorite memory in Australia <laughs> is when the flyweights debuted and Joseph got to have um, the first flyweight win and the first flyweight knockout. That was, you know, the proudest moment ever. And it, it, it created a weight class. So for me, obviously, as his wife, that is my 
favorite memory, but Australia has had such tremendous cards otherwise. I mean, honestly, if you if you look at that Holly and Ronda fight and what it did just for the world of MMA and women's MMA and, you know, all eyes were on the sport that night and you really felt it, I think that's probably my favorite Australia moment outside of being a very proud wife and, and seeing my husband <laughs> accomplish his goals there. But, I mean... I think anybody who was at that card or who was a part of that event just really felt how monumental it would be, and, and it truly was. So, you know, I remember sitting next to Demetrius Johnson in a like a bar here in Kansas City when that fight happened. It was insane. But last question before I let you go. You've been a huge advocate for fighters, and you use your platform to uplift them and tell their stories. During the last 10 years in the UFC that you've had so far, how has getting to know these athletes and telling their stories changed you as a person? Oh, man, what a good question. Um, you know, for me, because I am married to a, a former fighter now, but um, it's all about the human being. And I think oftentimes, whether it's in fighting or any other professional sport, we look at the people who are entertaining us as less than human or something that's there for us. And for me, if you can learn a little bit about that athlete's background, it's going to give you a reason to care besides just wins and losses or what color shorts they're wearing or what camp they fight out of. So it's changed me because these athletes come from tremendously challenging backgrounds and they never give up. I mean, no one fighter story is the same and probably no one fighter has had an easy road to where they are in both life and the organization. Um, and so it's all about highlighting what they have come through to be an example for others. And certainly they've been an example for me. I mean, those stories that you hear week in and week out are almost unbelievable, but they're all true. And it just makes you think like, if they're doing this for us, the least I can do is present their story as the best of my abilities to the rest of the world. So hopefully lift them up and, and get them all the notoriety and all the positivity that they deserve and not just there for, you know, entertainment purposes. Well, Megan, thank you so much for joining us. You're the gold standard of professionalism. And I know myself and a lot of people look up to you. Thank you so much for the incredible work that you do and continue to do. Oh, you're going to make me cry. Thank you so much. And congratulations <laughs> to you. You are absolutely killing it. Thank you.